He's, uh, he's Richard. All right, the man himself, James Bond. I, I really can't tell you how inspired I am by all of you coming out. Uh, there has been an awakening, and we've all felt it. There has been a change in our hearts and our minds. The fact is, raise your hand if you are under the age of 30 years old. I, I'll let the paint flame pass. I absolutely put faith in young people. Young people are not caught in the thought prison of their parents. Indeed, when I meet young people who are coming to the alt-right for the first time over the past three months, I am amazed at how serious they are. I'm amazed at how inspired they are. I'm amazed at how radical they are. So thank all of you. And please give a big round of applause to Colton who did this. Colton is, Colton is 19 years old. Colton is 19 and he set up this rally. He invited all of these great people. Colton also, when these losers and freaks who are having some other, you know, oh, we're a bunch of liars rally. When they went against him, when, when, when they tried to shut down this rally, when they tried to ruin it, he said, fuck you. He stood up against those people. If every white American had the balls of Colton, this battle would already have been won. So thank you, Colton. So let's talk about free speech. What does free speech mean when we have nothing to say? In the current year, we have been disintegrated into 140 characters, into an Instagram filter, into your favorite unboxing video YouTube artist. Free speech for people who don't really believe in it effectively means arguments over one's favorite shampoo. It means arguments over tax rates, where some radical libertarian might ask for 20% while the socialists ask for 40. Free speech means nothing when one has nothing to say. Free speech is only meaningful. The rubber only hits the road when you say something that matters, when you say something that's powerful, when you say something that threatens the system, when you say something that's radically truthful, when you say something that shatters the lies, that shatters those in power, that is the time when free speech really matters. And that is why we are here today. The fact is, there's something a bit self-congratulatory when we talk about free speech. I would imagine if you talked, if you interviewed every single American, at least 99% would say, oh uh, yeah, yeah, I support free speech. Oh yeah, I support free speech, yeah. So you, know, you're, you have your right to your opinion, man. Yeah, you have your right to your opinion. We don't have some Stalin-like figure sitting up in a room somewhere, twirling his mustache and slashing out newspaper headlines or pu putting a revolver to the head of a journalist and telling him what to write. We don't live in that world. That world is very easy to criticize, that caricature of communism or fascism. That world is very easy to criticize precisely because we don't live in it. We face a very different challenge. On the one hand, we do face something like that repressive dictator of folklore, but we don't actually face it in terms of the government. We face it in terms of Silicon Valley. We face it in terms of the Zuck, not so much 
in terms of Uncle Joe. We face it in terms of digital platforms that are kicking us off. We face it in terms of social networks that are suppressing free expression. And we also face it in terms of shrill little girls who try to attack art. But that's not ultimately the real challenge. The real challenge is within ourselves. We are the ultimate censors of free speech. We aren't willing to be honest even when we're alone. There is a black cloud that hangs over whites around the world. You can call that black cloud whatever you want, white guilt. You could call it the legacy of slavery. You could call it the Holocaust. You could call it fascism. You could call it systematic racism. You could use whatever terminology you want. But we have a black cloud that hangs over us. This sense of guilt, this sense that we cannot be truthful even when we're talking to ourselves. This sense we can't be truthful when we're talking to our friends and family. And certainly we can't be truthful when we speak in public. That Stalin, that a repressive dictator is, is ultimately the person in our mind. The person telling us not to speak. The person stamping out the truth. The person destroying who we are. The most radical thing one can say in public is not stop the war, although I might actually agree with people who say stop the war, by the way. But those people aren't being kicked off Twitter. The most radical thing one could say is not feed the poor, although I might also agree with that sentiment. Yeah, feed the poor. Feed the poor. <laughs> Those people aren't being viciously attacked by the gutter punks who call themselves Antifa. Fuck Antifa! Ooh, bunch of <laughs> the most radical thing anyone could say, and I guess for you young people, if you really want to shock your liberal boomer parents, the most radical thing for anyone to say is I am white. My life has meaning. My life has dignity. I am part of a family. I will fight for my children's future. That is what they want to suppress. that's why we're going to say it. I was actually reading a little bit about the Magna Carta this past week, and many Americans will look back upon the Magna Carta as if it's the Declaration of Independence written in Middle English, and that it has claims for free speech for all, and God-given rights, and equality and uh, global unity and all that stuff, that is a total myth. That document, which is looked upon, rightly in many ways, as a foundation of our liberties, is a bit of a myth. It was actually annulled a few days after it was enacted. The Magna Carta also includes a couple of lines that might very well be considered hate speech in the current year. The Magna Carta might be a myth, but it actually teaches something. It teaches us something about the nature of free speech and the nature of reality. The Magna Carta was not a universal document. No one believed that free speech is granted to you by God. Indeed, God's representative on earth annulled the document. The Magna Carta was an expression of rebellious barons who, through unity, achieved power and took their rights from King John. In this way, our right to speak is intrinsically linked with our ability to be powerful, with our ability to stand for ourselves 
and not stand for others. Our free, no free speech is ever guaranteed by a deity. Free speech is guaranteed by our willingness to be powerful and our willingness to stand strong. Our willingness to act like those barons who challenged King John. In this way, free speech is intrinsically linked with the right to bear arms. Machiavelli and others thought republicanism was utterly impossible without the citizen soldier. And there is, there is no question that the right to bear arms is intrinsically linked with the militia. This is actually a foreign concept to us in 2017. It's all fine and good to talk about gun rights and we want to protect ourselves and our family. I absolutely support that. But let's also be real. Let's also think about what we've lost. We aren't citizen soldiers, we aren't Republicans. We are, in a way, helpless citizens of a state that often seems omnipotent. <laughs> They're black helicopters as well, watch out for this. Alex Jones. When you look at that, say, that live leak footage of soldiers who were in a hel uh, Apache helicopter gunning down Iraqis as if they were playing a video game, you are in a way looking through the eyes of God. This state feels all-powerful. We're, all, we're helpless victims who hope that we might maintain our free speech as if it were just given to us. We need to find a way out of this situation. We need to find a way out of this sense of atomization, hopelessness, and weakness. We need to find a way to become who we are, to affirm who we are, and to achieve power together so that we can have real rights. Rights to be ourselves. Rights to live in a safe space. Rights to guarantee the future for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We need to find a way out of this helplessness. And I, I will say that the alt-right is the first step towards that. The alt-right is the first step towards believing in ourselves, towards carving out a future, towards guaranteeing a future for our children. Many people ask me, who are the great enemies that we face? Is it Antifa? Is it Hillary Clinton? Perhaps. Like Antifa can be swatted like flies. Clinton's just an expression of some bigger problem. I think the greatest problem that we face, the true enemy, is a concept that was called the end of history. The true, thanks for the applause on that one. As the Cold War ended, liberalism and Americanism lost its enemy. It lost its boogeyman. And it began to feel that history was over. Now you could see that as some kind of America, fuck yeah, triumphalism. But that would be the, to misunderstand it. The end of history means the end of meaning. It means that there's nothing else outside of consumer products. There's nothing else outside of individualism. The wars, if we fight them, are not, they're not for a people. They're not even for power. They're to turn Iraqis into consumerist slaves. They're turned Iraqis into as nihilistic and as death-ridden as we are. That is the end of history. The end of history is utter nothingness, nothingness and meaninglessness. 
the end of history is that you do not exist. You have no history. You have no future. You are an individual bouncing around on the internet, bouncing around between various consumer choices and social lifestyles and sexual orientations. You are utterly fragmented until you're fragmented into utter nothingnessness. That is the end of history. And that is what we are fighting for. We, we, we aren't fighting for freedom. We aren't fighting for the Constitution. We aren't fighting to liberate some foreign people who will probably rise up against us five years after we leave. We are fundamentally fighting for meaning in our lives. We are fundamentally fighting to be part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We are fighting to be part of a family together. We are fighting to be strong again, to be beautiful again. We are fighting to be powerful again in a sea of weakness and hopelessness. That is our battle. Our greatest enemies will tell us that there's nothing to fight for, that it's all over. All you have to do is go to the voting booth or go purchase some cute new product or watch some cute new video. We are gonna fight for meaning. We are gonna start history all over again. Thank you very much. That is doable. Let's five years from now, let's have a hundred thousand people or a million people out in the mall. Let's march for us. Let's march for our rights. All right. Anti. Okay, sure. Duterte hates all. You will not replace us. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Thank you. Charlottesville, before we go, August 12th, right? Yes. August 12th, Unite the Right Rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. We were, I, I just want to say something really quick. Charlottesville, Virginia, what was it late April or early May? May, a couple of weeks ago. That was an amazing event, and that was done completely privately. That was not publicly announced, and we had 200 people out there, amazing aesthetics, amazing people. We are going to do something even bigger, even more outlandish, and e even even greater than what we did last May. That's going to be August 12th. So everyone here, come out to Charlottesville. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll be there. Nathan, uh, Pax, Baked Alaska, uh, Mike Enoch. I could go on. It's going to be an amazing event, so come out. But thank you for coming out today. It was really meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. USA! USA!